welcome to day two of our international symposium here at CSU. We're so grateful that you're taking the time to join us for this uh, session this morning on CSU Innovating in the World. Our moderator for today is Carl Hammerdorfer, who is chairman of Story Sport, sorry, Story Spot, and is joining us today from Kosovo. So thank you for being here. And our panelists are Brian Wilson, Executive Director of the Energy Institute here at CSU, Daniela Boiso, Community Relations Coordinator at Trees, Water, and People, and Brittany Sly, Nutrition, I'm sorry, Manager for Nutrition and Wellness Programs and Housing and Dining Services here at CSU. Thank you so much for being here, and we look forward to your panel. Thanks, Sarah, and uh, hi from Kosovo to everyone out there. Hopefully there are actually a few academics from the University of Pristina on this, on this call, or on this uh, symposium, this panel. Um, so the Office of International Programs um, put this panel together to represent the unique perspectives on global engagement and innovation of, of a senior tenured faculty member, uh, be Brian, a graduate student and staff member, and an alumnus of CSU working with a local international NGO. Um, and uh, as someone who works with universities on other continents, I very much have come to appreciate how structures at CSU and at other American public research universities incentivize and support faculty and students, how they support in, uh, innovation and practical application of scholarship and research, and how they foster collaboration internally and externally. Uh, so we have a, a few questions for the panel. Every, every panelist will address each question. Um, and then you, you all can send your questions in via the Q&A um, button down there at the bottom. And then hopefully at the end, we'll have 10 to 15 minutes to answer some of those questions. So let's get started. Um, I always defer to uh, my elders. So I'm gonna start with uh, Brian, Dr. Wilson. Um, and Brian, start by briefly um, telling us what you're doing in the innovation space and how, um, how has the COVID pandemic helped or hurt your own efforts to be innovative in your development work? Un unmute, unmute, Brian. Gosh, I'm gonna be so glad uh, to move beyond this phase of our lives. But uh, thanks to the Office of International Programs uh, for organizing. Uh, and thanks to Carl for uh, hosting. Just want to, want to know that we have a real rock star uh, of a moderator. Actually, we have a rock star as a moderator. So many people don't really know that one of Carl's claims to fame is that he's also a musician. Uh, and in his work at Peace Corps, uh, had a couple of uh, very important songs um, on hand washing and diarrhea prevention. Uh, that are still in play on West African airways, uh, which is actually um, brings home, which is a, a novel way of accomplishing a task, which is one of the first definitions of innovation. It's a new way of accomplishing uh, a, it's a new process or method to accomplish something. But the other uh, definition that I really like is um, Andy Hargadon at UC Davis, uh, who defines innovation as the network you put together to get important things done. It really uh, moves you from this idea that, um, an in that innovation is about the lone inventor and really says it's about the um, uh, process and the group you bring together to do good things. So uh, my career in this, uh, I am the director of the Energy Institute at CSU. We've uh, spent a long time developing large scale, scalable solutions uh, for everything from natural gas pipelines, um, uh, reducing emissions from those. Our grid lab was funded by the government of Denmark to figure out how to use wind energy more effectively in Denmark. But on the international front, uh, a lot of our focus has been on energy access in the developing world. Uh, so one of the uh, 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 area that I'll probably focus on most today is our work on clean cooking. So as cool as big grids and pipelines are, the biggest energy problem we have globally is cooking. 
half the world's population cook every day on solid fuels, um, wood, dung, crop residues, smoke from cook stoves kills over 4.3 million people a year, more than AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis combined. Um, because of our work on engines and combustion, uh, we recognized um, back in about 2000 uh, that uh, there really wasn't uh, high quality measurements being made of cook stoves. So because we had a lot of great equipment funded by industry, we began uh, applying that to cook stoves, developed the measurement protocols that have now been used uh, uh, globally. Uh, and then in uh, 2008 or so began manufacturing cook stoves and now um, sell cook stoves throughout Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Um, the piece I think that um, uh, has really been impacted by COVID. Um, our, number one, um, our team have not been able to travel uh, to, you know, our work is inherently um, global. Um, and uh, so, um, and I would say that the relationships that we have in place that were strong, we've been able to continue, um, but um, uh, new, uh, new contacts are much more difficult to make um, over uh, over Zoom, and particularly because we're often working with the poorest segments of society. Uh, the you know that that uh, portion of the population uh, is not participating um, in the same uh, internet economy that we are. So that work has certainly been impacted. Thanks, Brian. So. Uh... Not making any assumptions about age or seniority, but Brittany, would you like to talk a little bit about what you're doing um, in, in, in the innovation space? And again, has COVID affected that in any way? Yeah, so my, um, my dissertation research has been based in um, Rwanda. And in Rwanda, what, we've, what we have been working on for the last couple of years is trying to um, address malnutrition at the household level by increasing diet diversity. And we've done that by incorporating kitchen gardens with it at the household level, so within the community. And we used uh, methods that are um, kind of in this participatory action research space, which is a, a newer approach for some, some disciplines. And, you know, essentially participatory action research really involves not only the research participants, but also the stakeholders in the community. And it really, uh, you know, it's needed that everyone in the community has a good rapport and understands what the goal is and under, it's very transparent. And so I would, you know, agree with Dr. Wilson that, you know, not being able to go and, you know, finish the last part of the project that we wanted to in country was because of COVID was, was hard, but I will say technology is amazing. And, um, you know, uh, being able to do WhatsApp videos and still talk to people um, at, four in the morning here, you know, um, was was amazing. And I think it was almost the same as sitting next to someone in some regard, because you could still see each other versus just a phone call or filling out a questionnaire. Um, the other really cool thing is we are doing hotspot analysis, analysis with ArcGIS in terms of some of our data. And so, you know, when we first took our GPS data at the beginning of the project, we had a special Garmin that we went around and did our GPS kind of tracking. And then we realized that most smartphones have, you know, GPS tracking and we were able to figure out how to use that data. So my liaisons in country, you know, we were able, we were like, we'll just use your cell phone. And so it was really amazing to kind of quickly think that's outside of the box in order to still accomplish the goals of the project and still keep that connection with some, um, with the participants in the community, um, even if it was on a tiny screen, um, but it was really, that was really cool. Thanks, Brittany. Um, Daniela, um, tell us a little bit about um, what you and Trees, Water, and People do in the innovation space and, again, uh, respond to the COVID condition. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Carl. And, yeah, I think as, as a staff at, at TWP, we've become innovative ourselves and learned new skills uh, going and adapting through COVID-19. Um, and because of our work being so international in Central America, we have also sort of in a way trained or adapted along with our partners who are the ones that have become the most innovative out of all of us. So they've been learning mapping skills, um, doing interviews with you know different tools such as Kobo, 
um, or Google Forms that they've never used before. So they've begun kind of this self-training um, with us and it's been really magical to see them grow uh, as local partners. Um, and basically they're the one, they're the champions that go out into the field and still do this work with COVID-19 hitting. Um, and in terms of, of COVID-19 and the communities, you know, that has shifted our work um, to different areas that we weren't solely focused on. We're now focusing on food sovereignty projects such as seed banks and community gardens. Uh, we're really trying to tackle climate migration because COVID and everything else has basically forced people out of country. So how can we invest in rural communities and keep them, keep them together, keep them safe? Um, improving cook stoves, because if you, you know, families have bad health because of smoke coming from cook, cook, cook stoves and then they get sick with COVID, that that becomes worse. So trying to innovate new ways of improving cook stoves, improving our programs, but also trying to maintain families together. Um, and climate migration is, I think, the, the backbone of our work currently with hurricanes and climate change. As you, most of you know, the hurricanes that passed through Central America, that altered everything that we were doing. So we have become more innovative and shifted our priorities of projects, um, but it's all worked out and we've all been working together and we couldn't have done it without our partners, which are the true rock stars of, of this work. Thanks, Daniela. Um, and uh, I'll exercise my editorial option here because um, I know there are some some of my colleagues from the University of Pristina on this call. And I think here, I mean, it's a typical developing country. People look with envy at the sort of institutions that we have. And CSU has got that lab pictured behind Brian. That is a, an amazing facility if anyone's ever been through it. Uh, I, They've got gigantic motors, pipeline motors in there that they're doing testing on. And CSU runs, what, $350 million in research a year. And yet you guys are talking about things that are comparatively small, like cook stoves and how much, how much impact these very small technologies do, uh, do have globally. So I think that's a point I wanted to make for our international um, uh, viewers. Now, moving on, um, Danielle, you started with, you, you anticipated the next question on climate. As big a problem as COVID is, uh, we, we're all being told that, that, uh, that the climate uh, problem is, is going to dwarf COVID, <laughs> hard, hard though that is to believe. So uh, let's start with Brittany first this time. Brittany, can you talk about um, ways that you see innovation, either your own or elsewhere in CSU, uh, being harnessed to address the world's effort to move towards carbon neutrality in the coming decade? Yeah, um, no, I don't have as much to say about, about this because um, I don't want to sound like I, I don't, I want to make sure I know what I'm talking about, but um, I think that one of the, one of the biggest things, and I think I'm just a, a big champion of collaboration, especially with the people who are directly involved with anything. So, you know, there are, to, you know, I know there's a couple schools of thought in terms of how we achieve carbon neutrality. Like, is it at the grassroots level? Is it at the bigger corporate corporate level? Is it a little bit of both? Um, and and I would say that I think, you know, making sure that no matter where we use innovation, that it it's it is usable, right? So and it's usable for the people that it directly impacts. And I and I think CSU and the way collaboration. Is is so rampant in our in what we do. I think is, um, I think is kind of on the right track for that. So, great, thanks. So, Danielle, I will go with you second on on the climate slash carbon question. Um, yes, um, it doesn't necessarily be connected to CSU, but I know it probably. <laughs> Yeah, no, I actually um, excitingly have a, a perfect example of um, what Brittany was touching on collaboration between CSU and TWP in terms of a carbon neutrality project in the long term um, with, you know, we collaborated with CSU on a study on the impact of wood burning Husta cook stoves in Central America, particularly in Honduras. So how much of those particulates um, are decreased by the certain type of model that we cr create as TWP? Um, implementing all those cultural aspects of like the type of stove you use and the design and the chimney system and how you maintain um, a, a cook stove properly and how that design and that innovation has dramatically or drastically improved people's health um, because of soot and smoke, but also reducing the amount of deforestation in an area. So 
that all ties into carbon neutrality. Um, and I think that's been one of the best examples I could use in collaboration of, of both our institutions and our organizations of, of doing great work and innovative work to become carbon neutral. So I'll be happy to share that study with you guys if, if anybody's interested in reading it. Um, it's magnificent and it's gotten really good reviews. So I think that that's like the one and only um, thing I would like to touch on based on that question. So thank you, Carl. Thanks. Um, so Brian, uh, looking forward to hearing you address this question, not only from the CSU perspective, maybe more broadly also from the work you did at ARPA, maybe you could talk, brief, describe that briefly and how that connects maybe to the larger public research university system. Well, so the, you know, the first thing that comes to mind when we talk about uh, carbon is uh, we just need more technology. But I actually want to start with the underlying premise of energy justice uh, that um, we that uh, while we use too much energy in the developed world, we need to be able to access more energy in developing nations. Uh, so there's a very uh, clear and proven linkage uh, between uh, energy use, human health, um, and uh, essentially the human development index. The challenge is to allow more access and use of energy in developing nations uh, without commensurate uh, increases in carbon dioxide. Um, and uh, uh, technology is, uh, you know, is uh, can help us there. And we have, you know, I, I was fortunate to spend time at the Department of Energy at the Advanced Research Projects Agency for Energy when we got to do the most mind-blowing technology uh, stuff that was uh, our task was to do the research that was too high risk for, for anyone else. But realistically, uh, the biggest challenge we have is, is adoption of the technologies that we have. And what we have in developing nations is the opportunity for leapfrog technology. So for example, we're, uh, there's a lot of, uh, well, last week's uh, debacle in Texas uh, in, the na in the energy capital of the nation, arguably of the world, um, where they shut down because of the poorly designed electric grid. Uh, we have the ability to, and, and that's largely to the political legacy. Um, we, a lot of it, we've been working on microgrids uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. So basically you're building grids from the ground up using uh, solar, um, uh, direct current or small alternating current systems. So every village sort of stands alone, which really leads uh, to resilience. And, but we have the ability to immediately to uh, more uh, high efficiency technologies. But I'll, I'll, I'll make one more case to this. Uh, and so a lot of our work is focused on how do you how to use technology to turn down seduction. We also should be thinking about how to use agricultural systems uh, to capture and store carbon in the soils. Uh, and uh, that's an area where CSU has strong expertise and the soils of the world represent one of the largest potential reservoirs for carbon dioxide storage. And that's done by improving agricultural practices and, uh, you know, uh, uh, and, and the, the type of work the trees water uh, people has, have done in terms of um, uh, reforestation and improved agricultural practices. Great. So there's 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 that marriage between the behavioral sort of low cost stuff, high effort, low cost stuff, and then the high tech stuff that that's happening in labs across the world. Okay. Abs absolutely, we, we we tend to think that the. That's the technology will save us, but it's it's the human in the loop that is actually the most difficult to deal with. Are you are you still is CSU still doing the kind of meth the work on methane release in the in the natural gas pipelines? Is that something that's still happening? Do you want to say anything about that? Um, uh, sure. You, you know, we know that um, if we shift to electric power production from burning coal to burning natural gas at face value, that reduces your CO2 emissions by about half. But the primary component of natural gas is methane. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a much more greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. 
So if you're losing any at all, if you're leaking more than maybe just a, you know, one to two percent, you've you've off a lot of the CO2 reductions that you got from switching from coal to gas. So this is an area where technology can help us. Um, one of the things I was able to do when I was at Department of Energy was fun work to develop um, cool new technologies to to find methane leaks and the and the uh, you know on, on well heads on pipelines uh, even in uh, cities and in homes and methane is one of those things that's actually fairly easy to fix but difficult to see so we were able to develop uh, new types of uh, cameras new sensors things that we could put on drones, on, you know, on aircraft flights. So, um, and, and actually we now, CSU now hosts um, the uh, methane test facility for the Department of Energy. So about three miles from here, it looks like there are seven oil and gas wells on CSU land. They're not producing wells. They're actually just, it's the equipment that are fitted with um, leaks, very precise leaks that we can turn on and off that we use to test new methane technologies. But that's an example of a problem that really just was identified maybe in 2000, began to get a focus just about 10 years ago. And in the intervening time, we have been able to develop new technology, mobilize political will, and have fundamentally changed practices in that, in that industry. Uh, and this is one that uh, the industry has also bought into. Uh, in fact, much of our work that we've done as the university side, mapping out methane emissions was done in unique partnership between the natural gas industry and the Environmental Defense Fund. So basically industry and the environmental groups working together to solve an important problem. That was effective and we need that collaborative um, focus on more important problems. Great, thank you. Um, so shifting from, um, from carbon, um, Let's go to food, food systems, and nutrition, and um, would love to hear each of you talk about um, the sorts of innovation that you're doing in that space or that your partners are doing in that space, the opportunities there, and again, how that connects to um, either CSU or your, your other public, private, civil society um, networks. So let's start with you first this time, uh, Daniela. Sure. Thank you, Carl. Uh, yeah, like I mentioned before, uh, this was probably food sovereignty was one of our biggest focuses for 20, 2020 during COVID, particularly when, when lockdowns went into place. A lot of these communities, particularly in Central America, were basically closed off and they, were, they had no access to go to supermarkets and get food. So a, a big focus of our work was trying to say, how can we invest in these communities for them to be sustainable for this? If, if this were to happen again, they wouldn't have to run through this trouble of, of worrying about food. So the idea of seed banks, I think that one's one of my favorites, came into play where we created this communal seed banks of uh, native seeds that the community would, would collect. And it kind of works through like a loan system. So the, the committee of a community would say, OK, we're in charge of the seed bank and we have X amount of seeds. And if a farmer wanted to come in and exchange seeds in return for a new set of seeds, then he could do that. Or he could borrow some seeds and then he would have to return 15% of those seeds in the future. Um, and the beauty of that program was that all of these communities surrounding those seed banks began to interchange seeds between themselves. And so the seed bank diversified largely, um, like different types of corn and different types of beets and different types of just a lot, a lot of vegetables. And then from that beautiful seed bank emerged these community gardens and local gardens and, and communities and schools and hospitals. So all of this idea of also nutrition and health started to, to sprout. And so a lot of women began to cook new recipes. Um, they started exchanging recipes between themselves. Um, and a lot of the youth started to get involved more into the organic garden and they call it um, sustainable family agriculture programs in some cases. And so they really try to just try to invest in the land again. Um, and with that comes irrigation systems and you know innovation of, of energy, how do we save water? Um, so everything kind of ties in. Um, and then the idea of agroforestry systems as well is one of our, 
our forte of how do you diversify your farm with different types of crops, but also implementing native tree species to improve biodiversity and overall health of your forest, right? So all of these, all of these came into play during COVID and they, and they grew exponentially because it was like the, the dire need of communities wanting to be sustainable, but also not having to depend on that outside world if a, if a pandemic were to hit or a hurricane would, came to hit. Um, so hurricanes were also a big, a big factor into this was um, a lot of these gardens were wiped out um, by the two hurricanes that came in within two weeks um, last year. And so communities had to basically rebuild, but they had the seed bank ready to go to have those seeds ready. So that's what we wanted was to establish that capacity building, that knowledge and all of that local knowledge that they already have um, to put it into play, to put it to good use. So now they're rebuilding all their gardens and starting from scratch, but they have the base already. So that's, it's been amazing to see the progress. Great, yeah, and I think that um, emphasizes the point that Brian started with Andy Hargadon's point that it's less about some brilliant inventor and more about um, the process, the group, the network and the system. So thank you for that. Uh, Brittany, um, you wanna talk about food and nutrition and innovation and things that you're working on or out of the university and maybe that you're working on in, in Africa or elsewhere? Yeah, um, you know, the project in Rwanda, it, it was, there's a lot of cross sections between um, Trees, Water and People's project is with ours um, and also with Dr. Wilson's talk um, in terms of people, you know, there's, there's this mix of results when we um, do nutrition and sensitive agriculture interventions in developing worlds. You know, we introduce new technologies, some innovative ideas, and we do an intervention and then we leave and it doesn't stick. You know, it's not a sustainable solution. Um, so part of our research was, well, how can we, how can we help it stick and, and show the value and allow it to be a sustainable change within a community? And so, you know, the way our project was designed and our, and our study was designed was we, we really involved the participants in the community in from the very beginning in terms of, okay, what are we going to focus on? What's the best way to um, organize this? What do, you, what do you think your needs are? Um, and, and then we would, you know, have the participants in the community reflect on that throughout the process. Um, and then, you know, they were the ones who really drove the process. I mean, there's so many times that participants would be like, oh, you are the savior. And I was like, I didn't do anything. Like I didn't grow any vegetables or do anything. You know, you did all of this. So, um, so shifting the focus that they are in charge, like they're the ones who are really can make decisions for their own health and their family's health and their community's health. Um, we introduced a, a couple different, you know, it's interesting. It's their more traditional methods of gardening that have been, have been lost. And so we're kind of reintroducing them back to, to the area. And, but they were amazed by those. You know, one is a keyhole garden. That's a raised garden to help with, um, you know, uh, soil runaway during the rainy season. Um, and then, you know, from there, I think what was really impactful is they, they saw changes in their family and their children's health. And they're, you know, they're, some of them are like, I look so beautiful now, look at how much weight I've gained or look, my child doesn't have to go to the clinic anymore. And then they would just tell their neighbors about it. And then their neighbors would come by and be like, what are you doing? What is this new thing? You know? And so, um, you know, it's, it's, it was really cool to see that just little changes like that and being able to have them really hold, you know, hold that, that it was their project. Um, I think was was amazing and then through COVID after you know talking to them and, and continuing to talk to them I think COVID has been able to try that sustainability aspect of the project because now you know the ability for them to go to markets um, where I work is really close to the Ugandan border and so a lot of people would cross into Uganda but that border has been closed for months now um, and so, you know, being able, they can't go and find work in Uganda necessarily. So the community is supporting each other by, you know, sprouting up these gardens through seed saving techniques that they can now spread seeds throughout their little communities and be able to teach other people how to grow their own gardens. And um, yeah, so I think innovation in regards to just even things that aren't new technologies, just something they used to do and now they're doing it again um, has been really impactful, at least with the community that I've worked with. Great, thank you. Warms my heart to hear that. One of my hit songs in 
in uh, Mali was about gardening, actually. <laughs> so it's great to hear your innovation there. Brian, I know you guys through EnviroFit and other work have, have worked, you're, you're well beyond a million cooks, I think, who've, who've used your product. So how is innovation, you know, how are you guys using innovation in the, in the food and cooking space? Yeah, well, uh, I'll start by saying I, I love the innovation examples that uh, uh, Brittany and, and Daniela talked about on uh, seed banks and peer seed sharing. But as, uh, as we became interested in stoves uh, and cooking, one of the challenges we realized was a tremendous amount of energy was being absorbed in the, in the, mat, in the, big, in the thick chambers of the cook stoves. And we realized we could actually really lower emissions if we could have a much lighter weight um, uh, chamber, combustion chamber. But if you made it out of steel, it would corrode within just weeks. If we went to uh, standard stainless steel, didn't last much longer. Um, very high nickel alloys were too um, expensive. So we actually went deep, established a partnership with one of our national laboratories, Oak Ridge National Labs. And uh, I don't know, oh, this is not working. I can see on my screen, it's not really working, but what you can sort of see in here is with the, uh, we have a metal combustion chamber. That was actually a new alloy that we developed um, working with this national laboratory uh, that just costs many pennies more than mild steel and um, enables essentially a, a, a five-year life. So that was a, that was sort of innovation at the technology level, um, but then you really face the, um, the issue of adoption. And the, the challenge is that um, uh, anything you, well, there's very few things that work as culturally tied to as the foods we eat and the way that we prepare them. Uh, so if going in and saying, you know, if only you would change the way you cook, uh, we could, you could reduce uh, indoor air pollution, is a really hard uh, sell. So the question is, how do you drive adoption uh, to a different way of cooking than their mothers and their grandmothers used? So one of the ways that we wound up doing that was uh, in, in India, we wound up uh, uh, making uh, essentially a little, uh, a short Bollywood video. Uh, one was of the uh, family using the traditional three stone fire and the wife was kind of mousy, the, uh, the, the husband was slovenly, the kid was sick, the house was dirty. And then there was the EnviroFit family. And she was beautiful and he was strappy and the kid was healthy, the house was beautiful. You know, there was singing, dancing. You know, it wasn't subtle, but if you watch Bollywood, Bollywood is typically not, not subtle. But the important thing there is that uh, the, we actually wound up spending a lot more time understanding what, uh, what you need to do to uh, have people adopt healthy cooking habits uh, than on the actual science of what happens in the combustion chamber. Great. Um, and you know, again, then you're talking, you, you guys spent hundreds of thousands or millions on the alloy and the thing, but then it's just social innovation or marketing innovation or business innovation that drives yeah. actually. And, 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 and you couldn't, I mean, uh, you can't really do one with the other. The technology was um, necessary, but insufficient, as we would say. Uh, we, we needed better technology, better uh, lower emitting stoves, but then we needed to be them to be adopted. So it's uh, you, you have to have the whole team. And again, the, uh, the, the definition of innovation is the network. Um, I'm gonna, before we get to question number four that we've all agreed on, I, we have a question from the audience about solar cookers using reflective solar light, I guess, heat to cook. Did Brian or Daniela, do either of you have anything good to say about that or bad? <laughs> Um, we, as TWP, we haven't used um, solar inter integration into our cook stoves. I think um, rural Central America is very, again, our, our stoves have adapted through the years um, based on those cultural, you know, aspects and, and women liking their cooking a certain way. So all of these innovations have been through the women that actually use these stoves. And so that has never come about. I think we, we really try to stay with the local mindset and the local need and the cultural aspect of a cook stove. 
Um, mm -hmm. But we do solar energy with with native native tribal lands here in the U.S. So that's a completely different ballgame. But no, I personally don't have any solar integration into into our stoves. Brian, I can say we looked hard. At, we, we we looked hard at solar cooking, and and Daniela has has laid this out. Um, that uh, there's a traditional ways of, I mean, you, I love the idea of using the sun to do everything, you know, and, and we do use uh, uh, solar photovoltaics for lighting, but uh, solar cookers only work um, on very clear days. If there's any haze at all, uh, you don't have the ability to concentrate. That's a challenge in the rainy season when it's cloudy. Uh, it's also, um, uh, not as applicable. It, it, it works better for boiling water than for cooking on a plancha stove to, to make tortillas. So you really have to understand the food that you're trying to, to make. You also have to understand when's the sun available and when are people uh, cooking. In a lot of area cases, people are cooking very early in the morning, later at night when they come back from the fields, uh, as opposed to during the middle of the day when the direct sun is available, so it's just been a it's been a it's been a uh, um, hard match. We've, we've looked hard at solar. We've um, tried to support um, uh, technology uh, development and supported uh, others doing solar uh, cookers. But um, it, it uh, there's there's a reason that you really just haven't seen the widespread adoption of concentrating solar for cooking. Thanks for that. And, and while we're still in food, I think we have time. There's another question about um, if any of you have received funding or done anything in large scale grain drying, let's expand that to food drying um, and storage, uh, stabilized food supply during drought years in, in the country. And anyone doing any work in, in the drying area? Okay, I, I can say that the, um, we actually um, have a partnership with um, UC Davis and we did some uh, joint work with, uh, with Davis, with some CSU teams and Davis teams looking at different technologies for grain drying. Um, and some of the interesting pieces coming out of that are that um, the way we typically think of drying grain, certainly in the US is with heat. You know, we, you know corn goes into the silo, uh, we, we, we bring it, and natural gas uh, uh, or propane to heat air and blow it through the grain. Um, on smaller scales, there's really interesting work on use of uh, desiccants, think, things like uh, uh, silica beads that can soak up a tremendous amount of moisture, uh, and then you can use heat later to, 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 to drive those off. So I think there's interesting pieces around that. One of the companies that was launched by a uh, Another company that uh, Envirofit is the company that does our uh, does cook stoves. Another company that we launched here is uh, called Factor E Ventures, and one of the companies that they have funded uh, is focused on uh, food drying, uh, mostly in India. But really, we're able to um, do some fairly simple things uh, to improve the design reduce cost um, of, um, of drying for fruits and vegetables. Oh, great, thank you. I don't know who asked the question, but if you're out there still, there's a company called Grain Pro that I encountered in Nigeria that's doing some really interesting and pretty low cost receptacles for storing and, and moisture control. So you might want to check that out, Grain Pro, advertisement for them. Um, so moving on to the next question, Brian, let's start with you again. Um, talk generally or specifically, if you like, about what CSU can do as a university. Let's say what any public research university can do to increase innovation internally and, and let's say the, you know, to get it adopted ex, uh, outside of the institution. Yeah, and I think I just want to tell the story how innovation develops and proceeds using the network um, model. And, um, and, and first, we, uh, CSU is, is in the same town as Trees, Water, and People, which is one of the uh, really effective organizations working in this. And, and uh, I was really introduced to the issue of cook stoves by uh, Stuart Conway at, at Trees, Water, and, and People. Um, 
but then same time, you know, I was involved with the tenure process and, uh, you know, wasn't able to think a lot about being overseas. But because of our work on engines and with combustion, we realized we had some of the best emissions equipment uh, anywhere. So we began as sort of a skunk's work project to, to just start measuring stoves and then realize that the way stove, that emissions were being measured was, was really not correct. No one was doing mass-based emissions measurements. So we began doing that first, just developing the techniques um, for that. And then ultimately uh, realize that um, if we want to have impact, we also need to be uh, uh, involved in applying what we were learning in the lab to actually develop products. So that's when we launched uh, EnviroFit International through a partnership with a colleague of mine and Carl's, uh, Paul Hudnut in the College of Business, uh, two of my graduate students, um, Tim Bauer and Nathan Lorenz. Uh, and then as that grew, uh, there were uh, faculty members in, uh, at CSU in, in environmental health, uh, Jennifer Peel, uh, John Volkins, Maggie Clark, uh, who were interested in the health impacts. And because we were distributing stoves, you know, that, then there was pathways to do experimentation. And one of the, one of the things we, that um, uh, uh, Jennifer and John Volkins realized is that the way we were um, determining health impacts was, was, uh, could be improved. Essentially everything that had been done to date was on multi-generational mortality testing where village A gets improved stoves, village B doesn't come back in 15 years and, and count the bodies and, and look at overall mortality rates. And they realized that the tools existed uh, to, uh, to do, uh, to, to apply new techniques. So, so here at our lab, we, we were able to help engineer a, a, a piece of equipment that volunteers would go into and they would we pump smoke into the room and mo monitor the immediate physiological response. And you can just, I mean, it, and that's, you can imagine all the, the approvals required to, to use uh, volunteers for human health experiments. But uh, that filled in a, that data filled in a really important gap uh, in what we've known about uh, 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 dose response or, or uh, the uh, the the, uh, the impact of uh, cooked smoke uh, dosage. And uh, but if you start to trace those linkages out, uh, the um, that has led to. Um, many other studies in the field on the area of cookstove. So there's probably over a dozen or more faculty members or researchers working on this area of, uh, of uh, cookstove, air quality. And I think CSU is probably a, really one of the leaders in that now. But that was, you know, it was, it was, it was the network model of just engaging others in this and being supportive when they wanted uh, to, if, you know, we were the engineers, but if the environmental health folks wanted to do something, we we're able to think about how could we actually make that uh, uh, help them with that. Great, thank you. Um, so, uh, well, let's move that question to Brittany. You said earlier that um, you found as a are you a, a PhD student? Are you right that you found CSU a really kind of open place where you can easily collaborate across departments and colleges and such. Um, I mean, the question was phrased, what, what can we do as a unit, what can CSU do as a university to increase innovation? Are there any, well, feel free to wax positively about um, CSU if they're doing everything they can to enable you to be innovative. But if, are there some things that you'd like to see some other innovations or approaches? I, I hesitate to talk about CSU as a whole university. I, I do think, um, you know, the, the ability to, you know, I have two hats where I'm a student, I'm a graduate student, but I'm also a staff and I've been a staff for a long time. Um, and I, anytime anyone's like, what's the best part about working for CSU? My, my answer is always that the ability to collaborate and do new things and to bring innovation to anything. I mean, it could be like, I don't, anything. Um, is pretty easy, you know, people are interested in that. They're interested in innovation and collaboration and um, new ideas. And 
And I think that goes across all walks in the university. So I, I really, I as a, myself enjoy that even as a student and a staff. Um, I think in terms of just, you know, continuing research and trying to increase innovation throughout, we're gonna like globally, I guess, you know, my biggest, my example would be that, you know, make sure that we really listen to those that are living in the space that need the innovation. I guess I, I continue to stress that. Um, I just think that too much energy and money is wasted sometimes on ideas that aren't gonna work for the people that it's intended for. So I really think, you know, making sure that we that we really do that. Um, the example with my project, you know, the at first there were so many ideas with, oh, let's do a community garden and let's do a school garden. And those ideas never got off the off the ground because the community vision board of that community were like, we can't do that. They're just gonna sell everything. They're never gonna eat that. That's not gonna help them with their household diet. And so we went about the project the way we did and we did see a change in their household. And yes, they did sell vegetables, but not until after they ate what they had first. So there was just a switch just because we, we really listened, you know? So, um, and I think that goes with anything, even as a staff member or a student, you know, just, just listen to people first for a while. And, and it's hard because we all wanna jump in and share ideas and, you know, oh, and I have this and brainstorm. And I think that's a great part of the process, but stepping back for a minute, I think is an, always an important professional thing to do and something that we as academics should continue to practice. Yeah, thank you. I think that's global. And, and actually, I felt lucky at CSU. We lived in a town where we had really at, at least one, trees, water, and people, but Village Earth, too, that were really, I just think, great examples of, of what you talked about, you know, getting the, you know, the actual uh, need from the actual user or the beneficiary. Maybe, uh, Daniela, do you want to talk a little bit about that and, and is that something you connect with the university on or that TWP just does on its yeah. own? Yeah, no, I, I think, that, I mean, we're lucky enough to also live in a place where we have such a amazing institution and I, and I have three key examples that, we, that we've had um, in collaboration with CSU that I think could keep innovating and there's also other opportunities that could come up, but for our native or a national program um, with tribal lands here in the US, we have collaborated for many years with the CSU forestry uh, or the nursery, excuse me. Um, and they're the ones that provide us the trees that we eventually plant in native lands in collaboration with many tribes. Um, and there's also this new emerging landscape, lands, landscape scale restoration project as well in collaboration with some departments at CSU. Um, and so including, I think the, the, the key phrase here is collaboration, like Brittany keeps saying, it's like you have the local knowledge, you have the partners, you have a nonprofit that kind of understands that social aspect of, of the work. And then you have like the academic researchy collaboration that could really, it could really bring about a lot of innovation and, and results and basically say, okay, what we're doing is actually working like on paper. Um, and that could be shared with other, with other people who are interested in like the effects or the impact of our work. Um, because we don't, as a staff, don't have the capacity to go that deep into a study. Um, so I think that those collaborations are, are beneficial to everyone, both to, to us as a staff, but also like our local partners. And I think CLTL program at TSU has also done some social science work with our communities in Guatemala, um, which has been amazing. And they report back to us and they say, hey, we lived here for four months. Your community is amazing. Your partners are amazing. You guys are doing awesome work. Um, and the CSU Environmental and um, Health Sciences, which is the one we did the study for cook stoves, was actually, like I said, a hit because it's been so many years of innovation and changes of designs of cook stoves, but the, what matters most is the, the health of the family and also the reducing deforestation. So do, do this, does this model actually help and is it working for the main purpose of this project, which is improving family health and reducing deforestation? And, and wood consumption, right? So I think it kind of gives us that validation that we're on a good path, uh, but there's still room for improvement and innovation and more collaborations to come. Um, so it's kind of like a turning wheel that it's gonna keep going, but, but we are very lucky that we have collaborated with so many departments at CSU and we hope to continue doing the same for like food sovereignty projects in the future, fire mitigation for, you know, here in the US, there's so much room for for innovation and creativity. So 
so we'll see what happens. But yeah, we're very excited and lucky to have um, collaborated with CSU. Sorry, so, Carl. I'd like to, if I could, I'd like to kind of just uh, just touch up some ideas about values, and we haven't really explained that specifically. But in Jim Collins's book, Good to Great, uh, you know, he talks about uh, you know getting the right people on the bus, and and uh, you know, and, and someone asked me what what does that mean? How do you know if someone is a, is a as a good fit or contributor to the organization? And he talked about innovation in terms of the three key qualities, and you should really be selecting people or partners based on values, will, and skill. And I think one of the things that, um, and, and I'll say that one of the things that attracted me to CSU was values. Um, the um, uh, the Peace Corps was launched by Maury Albertson at CSU. It was, uh, uh, I always got to get that uh, Maury Albertson piece in there. But uh, when I uh, was looking at CSU, I also had opportunities at some other universities, but Maury's presence here spoke to the value of the institution about having impact working internationally. And even though it was a while before I was able to do that, just knowing that, that this was an institution that valued that mattered. And I think in, to Daniela's um, uh, comments, um, the, you know, it's a, it's a community that also has values. Uh, and some of those values are around collaboration. It's also around socialization, you know, and, uh, uh, and, I, and I think that uh, it just needs to be stated is that, uh, uh, you know, we tend to hire people or think about skills, but the highest level is really values and then will, the willingness to just get in and do stuff. Excellent, thank you for that. Um, so uh, we've about 10 minutes left. I have a couple questions. We, we had a final question that we agreed on uh, as a panel. Maybe we could get through that in, in just a minute or two each maybe. Um, name one new innovation in the past five years, maybe the one that has impressed you most or left an impression on you most that you believe most impacts humanity in a positive way. That's kind of a tough question, so. Uh, let's start with you, Brian, on that. Well, I'm going to, uh, the, the, the challenge is picking the, the magic bullet, but we, we've been talking about cooking and food. So let me just go back to cook stoves. Uh, and, you know, we, I think we've done, uh, done a lot of innovation around making stoves work better, use less fuel, produce less pollution. But as good as we make the, you know, the combustion chamber of our stove, uh, it still produces more pollution uh, than something like using propane, LPG. But the challenge is I can go out and uh, get wood for free, or I can buy charcoal on a daily basis. If I want to use LPG, I have to buy a big canister of that. You know, and a 50 liter uh, canister can be, you know, 50, or 50 k kilogram canister is about $50. So it, it's actually in many places cheaper to use LPG than charcoal, but the issue is lumpiness of payment that I can't buy LPG on a daily basis. So one of the things we're able to do at EnviroFit is a concept that we call smart uh, cooking. And basically taking a propane regulator and embedding a flow meter, a cell phone and a GPS unit in it. Uh, so uh, essentially, uh, I can text in 50 cents uh, to the company and, and a signal goes out and it turns my regulator on and it meters the amount of fuel until I've used that. So there, there's some cool technology in that, but what's uh, compelling about it is that it changes, uh, it's an innovation to the business model. It changes uh, propane, something you have to buy once a month or every couple of months for a lot of money to something you can do on a daily basis that's much more aligned with the way economics work at the bottom of the pyramid. Great. Um, Brittany, uh, and when I say innovation, it doesn't have to be technology, obviously it could be ownership or financial or process. Anything that excites you? Um, I, did, I think 
and I, you know, this is, I don't know as much about different technologies. So, but from my work, just what I've noticed in the past, I would say six years or so, so maybe a little more than five years, is just the ability to, for people to have cell phones, I think has been, and it's a polarizing issue because it depends on who you talk to, but I mean, even Dr. Wilson talks about, you know, having an ability to have a cell phone to send payment. Um, I think even in my research, you know, being able for, uh, for so a rural effort, so, you know, sub-Saharan African farmer to call someone rather than walk two hours somewhere is, is a huge positive change for their lives on a lot of levels. Um, and then, yes, they have to pay for a network. I mean, Rwanda has their own network now, and they didn't before, but that's a, been a positive thing. Um, but, you know, they don't have to pay for a moto ride, which is ends up becoming expensive. Um, they don't, they can, you know, ask about market goods before walking there. So I think just sheer time has been saved for them, which is, I think, really improved their lives in terms of what they can do and where they can find work and is water available at this place? Is our seeds available? You know, so it's a simple thing, but it, it really has improved people's lives in a lot of ways. Great, thank you. Uh, Daniela, anything to yeah. Um, Song? Yeah, I just wanted to touch on, um, not particularly to technology, but I think the, the technology aspect of, of our partners has definitely improved um, our collaboration and our work on the ground. But more holistically, I think having becoming innovative is also collaborating with those partners on the ground that are have the same mission and values as you do, but also bring that new innovation and ideas to your work. Um, so we've, we've solely focused on creating those new partnerships and expanding our bubble in Central America and also in tribal lands. And finally, I think innovation comes with the local capacity, local knowledge and exchanges between partners and local communities. I think that that's increased through the years and it's become super innovative and creative. And that has created this amazing positive effect um, between communities um, without, with us, without us being present. It's, it's been kind of like this local exchange that people just learn from each other and they appreciate what they're doing. They learn and then they take it and pass it on to the next community. So I think that in itself is, is innovation um, for us and it's great. So that's, that's what I wanted to share. Thanks. Uh, now we're down to three minutes. I'm feeling a little bit like Judy Woodruff here. Um, I want to hold you to one minute for this last question. Uh, we'll start uh, with you, Brian, on this one. Um, the biggest barrier or challenge and how you got through that as an innovator. Um, it's, the, it's, the, it's the human element. Uh, it's, uh, it's the uh, it's the fear of new things, the fear of taking risks, uh, the fear of innovation. And how do you push past that? Just keep pushing? Keep pushing and, and, uh, and try to create excitement. Uh, you know, it's the, the way that, uh, and I'll just say the importance of socialization. Um, we haven't uh, talked a lot about the beer culture, but there's, you know, here in Fort Collins, there's a, it's a very social community under normal times. Uh, and uh, that is uh, those social networks uh, have been really valuable in being able to bring diverse people around and think about how to talk through uh, tough issues, launch ambitious new projects, support each other uh, on uh, things that we're trying to do. Uh, Daniela, biggest challenge, how you push through that? Yes, I think our biggest challenge being that we work with so many rural communities is that in-person um, interaction and, and listening and understanding what are the issues, what are the troubles, um, not being able to be on the ground to, to get the perspective of community leaders and members, but also our local partners has been really challenging. Um, you, you can't hear the voices of those most vulnerable via Zoom because they don't have access to technology. So that's been the hardest part for us as a staff, um, but luckily, like I said, we have the backbone of our partners and they're the ones that communicate to us. So they've become the, the major bridge between communities and us. Great, Brittany, any thoughts on that? Your biggest challenge and how you push through it? As um, I think it's, yeah, I think in, in terms of the human element in my work, um, you know, trying to work through the historical relationships between 
um, colonialization in Sub-Saharan Africa and me being the expert and them listening, you know, this us and them and trying to break that down and giving them that self-efficacy and confidence that they can change their own lives. Um, and they have, they're, you know, just as smart and, you know, just as that, that I think has been challenging. Um, but I feel like building good relationships and really listening again to people and um, using the, like the participatory kind of collaborative approach has, has helped start to push through that, I think, in some, in some areas of research. Great, thank you. Um, so we're at the end. Um, one last editorial comment. I, I spent seven years working uh, at CSU and I spent five trying to bring some of the systems uh, and that energy and the networks. Uh, couldn't bring the money, unfortunately, that, that American University has, but um, uh, you know, it was, it's, it's really, I, I really do think that possibly the most underappreciated social innovation in the United States is the public land grant university model. Um, and uh, you guys have been great and you've talked a little bit about that. Um, I thank everyone for tuning in. And uh, I think I turn it over to Sarah at this point. Yes, thank you so much for such an interesting and engaging panel. I feel like I learned a lot and um, wanted to hear you go on longer. I wish we had more time with you today. Uh, for folks who are joining us, thank you so much. Uh, there will be an evaluation that you can fill out after the session. I'm sure we'd love to hear your feedback. Uh, also, a recording of this session will be available on our website and on YouTube in the next few days. And I also just wanted to invite folks to our next panel starting in half an hour, what China did right in handling the pandemic. Thanks again to our panelists and to all who are watching. We appreciate your support and engagement with our office.